Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines. And by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF, and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation. Each year, millions of tourists visit Europe. They come from all over the world to walk through the great museums. They look at the celebrated monuments. They visit the historic homes. They taste the traditional foods and drinks. And this has been going on for almost 500 years. Beginning in the late 1500s, it became fashionable for wealthy aristocrats to send their sons on a tour of Europe. In the hope of completing their education with a look at Europe's classical art and architecture. Eventually, it became known as the Grand Tour. They saw the great Gothic cathedrals of France, the Renaissance frescoes of Italy, the Rembrandts in Holland. They were exposed to Europe's finest works of art. Ah, but they were also exposed to a variety of less scholarly experiences. I've been traveling since I was six years old. My mother would put me on a plane and I would fly by myself from New York to Boston, where my aunt would pick me up and take me to see everything she thought I was old enough to appreciate. I loved it. The Toll House cookies were the best. Traveling always brings back my sense of childhood wonder. It takes me away from the familiar comforts and the security of my home. Suddenly I am alone, I have a heightened sense of awareness. I'm forced to pay attention to everything that is going on around me because it's all new. The Swiss travel writer, Nicolas Bovier, said that when you travel, you are more open to curiosity, to intuition, to love at first sight. That's why I always bring a new pair of glasses, and it's how I met my wife. During the past few years, I have made two alterations in my approach to travel. First, unless there is a special reason, I like to travel to a particular location when most other people aren't. If you avoid the peak travel periods, almost everything is easier and less expensive. You don't want to show up in Asia during the weeks of the Lunar New Year celebration, usually in late February or March. Everyone is coming home for the holidays, and it's fun, it's a madhouse. I often go in the early spring or the fall, and I never worry about the weather. I remember what my youngest son tells me. There's no bad weather, there's just inappropriate clothing. And that from a five-year-old. This is the first of a series of programs that present my personal, slightly offbeat grand tour of Europe. I decided to base them on one of the modern river cruisers. They offer the extraordinary convenience of having your hotel come to you 
as you travel. This is the Ama Dolce, which is one of the Ama waterway ships. We started in Amsterdam in early November. Amsterdam is one of my favorite cities. It's filled with art, architecture, great museums, and places to shop. One of the guides on the Amma ship told me about Amsterdam's Museum of Handbags and Purses. It has over 4,000 objects, with some that date back to the 14th century. I'd been to Amsterdam dozens of times, and I thought I knew the city. But this museum was an extraordinary surprise. The collection was started by Hendrika Ivo. Today, it's run by her daughter, Sigrid. And my mother, she was an antique dealer, traveling through Europe to find her antiques, uh, small silver items on the table. Uh, cuddly and this kind of things. And then she saw a very beautiful bag made of tortoiseshell inlaid with mother of pearl, and she fell in love. Her mother spent over 30 years collecting handbags and displaying them in her home on the outskirts of Amsterdam. But eventually, she needed a bigger space. And we spoke a lot with the local government, uh, but that didn't work out. And then she put a sign on the door and uh, saying, SOS, who can help us for a new location? And she uh, asked also a lot of people, can you help me uh, with a new location? Uh, do you know a millionaire? I don't like to have them only for myself, but uh, half of it maybe. And then, uh, then one Sunday afternoon, a millionaire came along, visited the museum, read the sign, and bought them a building in the middle of Amsterdam. The museum illustrates the history of the handbag from the 14th century to the present. The earliest women's handbags were worn under their dresses. They had a, a ribbon with two uh, uh, pockets hanging on it, and then you have two or three underskirts. Then this ribbon goes around your waist, and then your nice dress goes over it, and there's an opening in the dress so you could reach your pockets. In the late 19th uh, century, it changed because the fashion got very slim. Here we are looking back to the Greek and Roman periods, and uh, the waist goes up into the, into the breast, and then you get very slim, tiny d uh, dresses. They have to look like a Greek dress, because that was fashionable in that period. And they were made of fine muslin, or very fine material, sometimes very transparent. Um, so then you can't wear these pockets beside. And then you see that the ladies wear, for the first time, the bag in the hand. And what did they put in their bag? A coin purse. Uh, you had a letter case for your letters. They were writing a lot. Maybe also a uh, card, a calling card holder. Because when you went to visit somebody, uh, you go there and then you say to the servant, uh, I would like to visit the lady of the house. But then she is giving the calling card to the lady of the house and she is dis deciding if she wants to see you. I've always wondered about the Queen of England. What does she have in her handbag? Cab fare? A Swiss Army knife? Keys to the palace? A lottery ticket? Inquiring minds need to know. She has never money with her. No, she has uh, a lot of uh, a camera, because she wants also to show where she is to her children and grandchildren. A lipstick. Uh, she has a powder compact, because that was given by her husband 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Sometimes for her dog things, because she likes her dogs. I also noticed in the last maybe 10 or 15 years that handbags become a symbol of status. Until the 60s, you could uh, show that you are rich or you are different by your clothing. But in the last decades, it's getting more and more difficult. Because what we see on the fashion show in Paris or Milan or New York, you can buy it uh, a little bit later in the shops and you can buy it expensive or cheap. It's copied all over. So it's very difficult to be different. And that you see that these big brands, uh, they come with handbags because that's something you can show that you can be different. But not everything what's in fashion will be fit you very nice. 
with a handbag will always fit you. So it's for the brands that have more emphasis on the handbags because everybody can buy a handbag from a brand if you have the money, of course. But it's everybody will shoot a handbag. Everybody will fit a handbag. You may not be able to get in to that dress, <laughs> exactly. but I certainly can carry that handbag. <laughs> yeah. The handbag is uh, the soul of women because um, all your personal items go into it and you don't want to show it to other people. But there are also a lot of things people, ladies don't want to tell about. For instance? That I can't tell you because that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Quite honestly, I think this is one of the most interesting museums I've ever seen and I strongly recommend it. At lunchtime, we headed back to the ship. Each day on board, there was a buffet with appetizers, soups, sandwiches, cold cuts, breads, a salad bar, two main courses, one of which is usually a carving station, a dessert table. Delicious. I love ice cream. A cheese board and fresh fruit. One of the keys to an enjoyable river cruise is the knowledge of the cruise directors. They need to know what is going on in town and the right time for you to make your visit. At the suggestion of the Ama Waterways cruise director, we spent the afternoon on a tour of the Hermitage Museum. It's an old building. It's an Amsterdam building. It's a landmark building on the river Amstel, which is interesting because so the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg is also on the river, on the Nieva. Well, the relationships between Russia and the Netherlands are very old. Peter the Great already came in the 18th century to Amsterdam to get inspiration for his new city, St. Petersburg. And the museum in, in, in St. Petersburg is very large and they really wanted to share their collection with the rest of the world. And since we already here in Amsterdam organize so many exhibitions from the collection of St. Petersburg, naturally we sort of started talking about um, a way of cooperation. Then this wonderful building came available and then finally in 2010 and we decided to open up this beautiful museum. What we do here is we make exhibitions. We make large, big exhibitions every six months from the holdings of the State Hermitage Museum, but also from other museums. Um, so in the future we will, we will work with other museums too. Uh, behind me now you see part of the new exhibition we have on Alexander the Great, which we're doing exhibitions on Rubens, we're doing exhibitions on Russian icons. They're all exhibitions with topics you can't find in Dutch museums. And one of the most beautiful things is a golden crown we have here from the beginning of the second century. It's a building from 1683 and actually built, not for a museum, but built for old ladies, to take care of old ladies. It was a church institution and it stayed that way until 2007 when the last person left the building and we could start renovating and building a museum here. This is the um, Amstel River, which is the heart of Amsterdam. And um, you can see also all the big houses are here. And it's interesting that this building is, is on, the, on the central river here in uh, Amsterdam. Like the State Hermitage Museum is in the center of uh, St. Petersburg. This used to be a church. It was a Protestant building. So everybody came here every Sunday to have their supper here, but also went to the church. So this, what you see here, is um, the organ which was given by a lady called Mrs. Kantler in 1810 for, um, for, for the, the dinner here. And now we have sort of changed it in a different room. We have music and concerts here. But you see some of the, of the things here still. And what we try to do is also to make modern design in all design. That's why we did this lamp, which it's very interesting because you think it's paper, but then in the end you see it's all very, very thin porcelain. It's very difficult to make. And of course, the nice thing is you see here the garden and you see the river there. This is a bleaching field where people used to bleach the laundry. And this used to be in Amsterdam everywhere. So where they, they do the laundry? They do the laundry, they do it on the grass and then it bleaches. Hmm. And our architect sort of reinvented this whole thing. I should have brought my laundry. <laughs> <laughs> That evening we returned to our ship for dinner. Dinner is a traditional four-course meal. Appetizer, soup, main course, and dessert. And there's always a red wine, a white wine, and a selection of beers and soft drinks that are free. 
Another great suggestion from the AMA crew sent us to the Dutch East India Man. The period between 1579 and the end of the 1700s is described as Amsterdam's golden age. And much of that gold came from importing spices from the islands of Bali, Java, Sumatra, Borneo, and New Guinea, islands which are now part of Indonesia. In 1748, the trade was dominated by the Dutch East India Company, which was the largest trading company in the world. A replica of one of their ships is docked in Amsterdam's harbor. So from here you can uh, see the compasses where they used during steering. The director of yeah. collections, yeah. Dr. Henk Dessens, showed me around. In the beginning they used just the ships that were used to sail with in European waters. But in a short time, the East India Company discovered that it was uh, important to make more standardized vessels. Um, the journey was very long, uh, the ships were expensive, so it was very important to plan all the journeys as much, much as possible. Shipbuilding was a kind of a magic uh, art. It was an art which was brought over from father to son. And the governors of the company didn't like that. They wanted to have more, more grip on the technical aspects of the ship. The main uh, space on board was of course the hold. That was the place that the ship was built for eventually because uh, she had to get spices and other trade from Asia and bring it back with high profits to the Netherlands. Most of the crew uh, lived on the quarter deck. Uh, you must imagine that on this quarter deck here lived about 300 people. There was no daylight in this space. Many people died during the voyage and people who survived got more space. The captain had in fact uh, two cabins on board. One was his, his working cabin where he did the navigation, had a meeting with his mates, with his officers. And he also had a, a separate bedroom. He was the only person on board with his own bedroom, with an ordinary uh, bed. He didn't sleep in a hammock, but he had, his, well, he had more privacy. I noticed that he had two toilets. How did he choose? I think that was dependent on the direction of the wind. One of the things I like about the AMA itineraries is the open time they give you. You can do whatever you want to, and the staff supplies you with the information you need to make the best use of the time, which I spent shopping. I have two favorite spots. One of them is a beer store. Uh, a beer store with 1,200 different kinds of beer from all over the world and in all different styles. This is the German section with lots of lagers and wheat beers. The Dutch people love wheat beers nowadays. You know, I learned years ago that when you clink glasses with regular beer, you go straight. But if you have a wheat beer, you only clink the bottom. On a great wheat beer glass, it's very thin at the top as opposed to the moss mm -hmm. which you can bang. Yeah. There was also a large selection of beers from the United States. It appears that small breweries in the U.S. are experimenting with different styles and that they are becoming more and more popular in Europe. Because uh, the hoppy beers are getting very, very popular with the, the real beer geeks. But what is also very popular are the, the Belgian ales. That's where the, the beer lovers start their hobby. And the Belgian beers are very accessible. St. Arnold, the patron saint of brewers, is credited with spreading the brewer's skill throughout Belgium. He was curious as to why the rich seemed to live longer than the poor. And he finally decided it was because they drank beer instead of water. And he was absolutely right. For centuries, the safest thing to drink was beer. Today, Belgium produces over 600 different beers, and beer experts have chosen some of them as best of class worldwide. The beer brewers of Belgium are the great artists in the business, and one of the oldest brewers is Lindemans. It's been in the same family for over 200 years. Their most unusual beers are called Lambecks. Lambecks are fermented by natural yeast in the air, and the fermentation process takes place over many months in wooden barrels and tanks. Lambeck is the meeting point between a beer and a wine. 
It's made from wild yeast in a process that's very similar to that used for making sherry. And like a sherry, it's aged for years in wooden casks. Some lambecs are blended together and aged to make a goose, which has a wine-like flavor and complexity. Lambeck brewers never want to make the slightest physical change to their brewery buildings because it might disturb the yeast. Belgian beers are also fermented with cherries to produce a drink called creek, or with raspberries to make a brew called framboise. Creek is the Flemish word for black cherry. Lindemann adds cherries to their lambeck, and the fresh, pure fruit flavor makes a great pairing with the tart complexity of the lambeck. The bar on the ship had a nice selection of Belgian beers, and uh, we put them to good use. The next shop we visited is one of the finest shops in the city. It's called the Cheese Room of Amsterdam, and it carries over 400 different cheeses. The owner is Luc Delour. He took me through the shop and had me taste an assortment of different cheeses, pointing out that as cheese gets older, it gets stronger, as opposed to my own pattern, which appears to be quite the opposite. And this is organic? They add nothing. Yeah, just milk. <laughs> you are. Yeah. Well, it's made a very different taste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there are also different farmers. Eh? All, uh, if every farmer has his own speciality of making cheese. Like the winemakers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cheese is one of our oldest foods dating back at least 3,000 years. One theory is that someone in Central Asia or the Near East was carrying milk in a bag made from the stomach of a calf, and the acid in the stomach, known as rennet, interacted with the milk and caused the liquid whey to separate from the solids known as curds. The liquid was drained away and the curds pressed together to form the solid cheese. In terms of survival, cheese has some distinct advantages over milk. It lasts longer than milk without spoiling, it's easy to carry, and it takes up less space, about one-tenth of the volume of the milk from which it was made. I only have one problem with cheese. If some cheeses are aged for months, even years, by the cheesemaker, how come they only last for a few weeks in my refrigerator? Some kind of manufacturer's built-in obsolescence? Inquiring minds need to know. What do you call it? Sticky finger. What a smell. No, thank you. <laughs> this was the first leg of the voyage that took us from Amsterdam to Luxembourg. Along the way, we stopped in Cologne, Rudersheim, Koblenz, Winnegen, Hochem, Zell, Berncastle, and Trier. Some of the passengers went on to Paris and some to Luxembourg. In part two of this series, our ship docks in Cologne. We'll take a tour of the city, visit the great cathedral, which has become the most visited tourist attraction in Germany. Stop into a museum that is totally devoted to chocolate. And if it's warm yeah, and fresh, it's a lot better. And serves a chocolate drink that made my day. We'll find out the origin of Eau de Cologne and drink some of the local beer called Kolsch. Then we'll sail on to Rudersheim to visit Siegfried's Mechanical Music Museum, a collection of robotic and self-playing instruments. And we'll meet the great Siegfried. We taste the local specialties, encounter the challenge of the drinking log, and finish off with a cup of Rudersheimer coffee spiked with the local brandy. <laughs> I hope you'll join us. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. For a printed copy of this show, send a stamped envelope and $3 to this address. Please mark envelope with show number. The same information is available free on BertWolf.com.
Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines and by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation. They look at the celebrated monuments. They visit the historic homes. They taste the traditional foods and drinks. And this has been going on for almost 500 years. Beginning in the late 1500s, it became fashionable for wealthy aristocrats to send their sons on a tour of Europe. in the hope of completing their education with a look at Europe's classical art and architecture. I've been traveling since I was six years old. My mother would put me on a plane and I would fly by myself from New York to Boston, where my aunt would pick me up and take me to see everything she thought I was old enough to appreciate. I loved it. The Toll House cookies were the best. Traveling always brings back my sense of childhood wonder. It takes me away from the familiar comforts and the security of my home. Suddenly I am alone, I have a heightened sense of awareness. I'm forced to pay attention to everything that is going on around me because eventually it became known as the Grand Tour. They saw the great Gothic cathedrals of France, the Renaissance frescoes of Italy, the Rembrandts in Holland. They were exposed to Europe's finest works of art. Ah, but they were also exposed to a variety of less scholarly experiences. Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines. And by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation. Each year, millions of tourists visit Europe. They come from all over the world to walk through the great museums. <laughs> 